So we are going to send this out to some people that have paid for our retreat that couldn't be here at this time. So thank you so much, Annie, for joining us today. I have my whole team here, Jess, Julie, and Connie, and Holly is moderating. So she's at home. So we are all on and excited to meet you. Well, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. So what we like to do at our retreats is we like to feature a celebrity. Um, and, and I say that S-E-W, celebrity. <laughs> and what's so neat about the industry that we're in, Annie, is as a business owner myself, I tell my customers that my entire shop is supporting small businesses like yourself. So with Absolutely. that, um, you know, we've had the Block Lock Lady. We've had um, Ten, Sisters. Ten Sisters the last time. We've had Whole Country Caboodle. Yeah. There's all kinds of just fascinating Jean people Taylor. out there that are doing wonderful things. And they're all supporting my business. So it's just wonderful to have another business owner like yourself join us. And to me, you're higher up on your business model than I am. I've been doing Someday, Pam. Someday. Someday. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I tell some people, I'm just a retired grandma. <laughs> and I just had, I was in the right place at the right time to open up a quilt shop. And it was something that I probably, I know I dreamed of in my twenties. I'm not 20 anymore, <laughs> but 29 again, 29 again. <laughs> But tell us, how did you get started with your business, Annie? Well, I wasn't quite a grandma when I started. I was old <laughs> enough to be one, but um, my kids waited until they were a little older to have kids. So I now have two wonderful grandchildren, but they've only been in the picture for about the past six to eight years. But I started, my kids had grown. We had had several businesses. We had lived in Alaska for 20 years. We built a country in there. We had a fishing charter business. So I'd always been really busy. We'd always had our own, own businesses, worked at home, worked with my husband from the day we got married at 20 years old. But um, I, my kids had grown and we'd sold all our businesses. And all of a sudden I really had nothing to do. And so I joined the local quilt guild and it was it just opened my world up. I made so many amazing friends and I learned so many things. We had retreats. I think I had every office that there was in the quilt guild at one point or another, sometimes more than one at a time because there weren't people who wanted to do things. But I really loved quilting and I decided I needed a way to pay for my quilting habit. I was a CPA and I did all the book work in our family. So my husband really wouldn't have known, um, you know, how much money I was spending on fabric. In fact, one day he walked into my sewing room, which was just a small, like 12 by 12 room, but it had shelves all along one wall from floor to ceiling, which were packed full of fabric. So you can imagine how many yards of fabric that was. And he kind of stood there and looked around and he said, man, you must have a hundred dollars worth of fabric in here. <laughs> and I just kind of said, yeah, probably. <laughs> and we left it at that. But I decided that I wanted to be able to go buy whatever fabric I needed without feeling like I was taking from the family budget. So I decided if I wrote patterns, that would be a good way to do it. And at the time, I was also doing scrapbooking and I was having regular scrapbooking workshops in my home. And one of my customers was sister to the man who was the publisher of Memory Makers magazine, which was one of the top um, scrapbooking um, magazines mm -hmm. at the time. And she came to the workshop and I had made an organizer to go on my door because if you've ever done scrapbooking, it's kind of like quilting and you have tons of little stuff. You've got scissors and snips and punches and stickers and, you know, all this kind of stuff and papers and you needed a way to, I needed a way to make them easy to access and also for customers to see them and pick out what they wanted to buy. So I had made this organizer that just hung on the on the door and it had all kinds of pockets in it. And she said, you know, 
we're getting ready to do an issue on spring cleaning. And I think our customers would really enjoy seeing what you've made. It would be a way for them to organize their stash. Would you care if I took a picture to put in the magazine? And I said, no, that'd be fine. And I said, why don't you say I have a pattern for it? Because I knew quilters, we like patterns. We like having somebody tell us everything of how to do it. And I knew I was going to get questions about how yeah. I did it. So I may as well have a pattern for it. And she said, okay, how much is it? And of course, I hadn't even written it yet. But I said, I knew how much patterns sold for. I said, $10. And she said, okay, I'll put that in. And so if you've ever submitted something to a magazine, you know that it takes a long time from when you submit it till it comes out. And not long after she and I had that conversation, my youngest sister's husband found out he had cancer and it was very aggressive for him. And within just a few months he died. And so I was spending a lot of time in Colorado helping her you know, get her life in order. She had two little girls and, and I was gone from home a lot. And kind of that became my focus. And one day my husband called and he said, I do not know what you've done, but you're getting all these $10 checks in the mail written out to you. And it's like, oh yeah, that pattern. And so fortunately I was headed home in just, you know, a, a week or so. And so I, an email existed by that time. So I could email everybody and let them know there was going to be a little bit of a delay, but I went home, got the pattern written, you know, made, made it all up and, and got that going. And that got me started. And I can't tell you what a, you know, what, it, how exciting it was to get a $10 check in the mail every few days and be able to go add a yard of fabric to my stash. So I took, I kept writing patterns. I took a class at the local college. I learned how to write HTML code. I made a website. I mean, this is back in like 2003 when websites were just getting started. There weren't very many out there. It was very basic. Um, it was a ton of work if I added a new pattern to remember all the different places to put it. But that's kind of where I got started. And, you know, I always say, be careful what you wish for, because, you know, i started that as a way to pay for my quilting habit and now I never have time to quilt but <laughs> that's a lot of sewing and that's a whole lot of fun so that's kind of kind of how I got into it well that's cool. that's very cool and yeah I I ran a business before too so I can kind of relate to what you are saying and my husband still owns a business and he's my machine tech so it makes for interesting times but hey it's a fun chapter in life and what an amazing trail you have left in your wake too. So when you started, obviously it was just yourself. What has your company grown to as far as employees? Tell us a little bit about that. Okay. So when I started, I actually was writing patterns and doing that for probably three or four years before my husband even realized I was doing it. He happened to open <laughs> one of the cabinets one day and he saw all the boxes of patterns in there. And he said, what is all this? And I said, well, they're patterns that I sell. And he said, what? And so he thought I was just doing Secret. quilt girl stuff because it was all kind of the same thing. And I was always busy at the, my desk with quilt girl stuff. So for a long time, it was just me and it was just a way to support my, my hobby. But then I started writing patterns for purses and bags that needed special things, zippers, um, stabilizers that would give them body and stability. So I developed a product called Soft and Stable that added that. And it got to the point where I needed other people to help me. I couldn't keep up with it all. So I had two part-time workers that were both college students that would come help me fill orders, help me package zippers. I had three friends who cut soft and stable for me and packaged it. And we kind of went along that for a while. My husband, we had property in Idaho and Montana and Oregon. So he was gone a lot, most of the year usually. And so when he was around, he would, you know, run stuff to UPS and do that kind of stuff. But it was really just me and these two girls working for quite a while. And my husband died suddenly in 2013. He had a heart attack and all of a sudden it was just me and I realized how much I had depended on him. He hadn't helped a whole lot in the business, but when he was here, he did the grocery shopping, the cooking, and you all know how much time that saves when you don't have to take time out to do those two things. So um, I was struggling to keep up with stuff and I, my son had gone to Spain. He'd gotten his MBA there. He had or come back with 
um, a woman that he had actually met in Peru, but they had um, come back and got married. And he was working as chief of staff to the president of a university in California. And I called him one day, this was a few months after Al died. And I said, so how are you liking your job by now? And he said, you know, I'm not really loving it. He said, I'm not using what I got my MBA for. I would really like to go somewhere where I can grow a small business. And I said, I have a small business you can grow. And I said, I would love to have you and Glow come. You can both have jobs. I'll match what you're making there. I'd rather give the money to you than to the IRS. And I said, my goal is that I turn over all the day-to-day stuff to you. All I have to do is write patterns, film videos, and teach classes. Well, it took us about three years to get to the point where I did that. But oh, before we say that, I said, but think long and hard. Do you want to work with your mom? And do you want to work with your wife? Because I had worked with my husband and we had two very different styles and things weren't always really easy. But um, they thought about it for a while. They decided, yeah, that sounded like a good opportunity. And so they moved to St. George in May of 2014, I think, and have been with me since. And and the business has grown exponentially since then. They really, Casey told me not long after he started working and I kept saying, oh, just let me do that. It's easier for me to do it than to train somebody else. And he said, if that's your attitude, you're never going to grow because you can't physically do it all. You've got to get helpers in here. So we probably have 15 to 20 that are here at the warehouse and in the office. We have another 10 or 15 probably who work at home doing things. So we have grown quite a bit, but Casey and Glow, I mean, I bless them every day. What a difference that has made to, you know, to turn all the <clears throat> decision-making over to them and and let them take care of training. And Glow helps me with patterns. She does photography. She does our purchasing. She does payroll. She does a little bit of everything. And it's it's just been wonderful to have them involved. Oh, how wonderful for you. And what a what a happy ending. I mean, we, those of us that are happily married can't imagine losing a spouse and kudos for you for keeping on going and solving those problems and how wonderful for your son and daughter-in-law to fit in so nicely into your business and help you grow. And the fact that they were competent people with the backgrounds, (laughs) that's, That yeah, Glow had actually never <laughs> sewn before she came. She when right after Al died, which happened right before Thanksgiving. So they had come and spent some time with me. And then I went to California where they and my daughter were both living. And we spent some time together. And Casey was working long hours at the university. And I knew Glow. I mean, she didn't have a green card yet. Um, she couldn't get, you know, go out and get work. And I knew she was just going to go nuts sitting in that house by herself. So I took a bunch of fabric and some patterns and zippers and my little Janome jam sewing machine. And I showed her how to make a ditty bag. Within two weeks, she was modifying it and adding straps and pockets and, you know, all kinds of things. And she just, she'd never really sewn before, but she was just a natural at it and and fearless, which I think makes a huge difference when it comes to sewing bags and purses. Well, that's that's really neat. Now, you mentioned that you had a daughter. So yes. is she close by or where where did she live? So she was in California at the time. She was an attorney and she was working for a firm in um, Seattle and they wanted to expand into California. And so she had gone down to California to open an office in Santa Barbara and to study to get her California bar to pass the California bar. So she was there for not too terribly long. Um, She fell in love with a young man who... um, She always wanted to move to Montana. After my husband died, we had a a part a 40 acre parcel there. And so they actually moved to Montana because he always had wanted to farm and ranch. And so they took over that property. She um, passed the Montana bar and worked for a while. And then when she had um, her child six years ago, um, she's kind of stayed at home, but they opened a wedding venue. So they have a a barn that they built for their wedding and they do weddings every weekend from about May to September. They're really busy. 
yeah, actually so, into November so, this year. So she actually never really learned to sew. It was never her cup of tea. She yeah. loves getting bags that I've made. She loves getting quilts. But one of these <laughs> days, she last year started picking up embroidery. So I'm hopeful that one of these years, maybe she'll still pick up sewing. But she's too busy right now to even begin to fathom doing that. Right. Um. Does she have a website? Or she uh, does. It's ruggedhorizon.com. So R U G G E D and then H O R I Z O N.com. Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll look her up. Yeah, Yeah, it sounds like you have two very competent children. So you did something right, Annie. (laughs) Well, they kind of grew up, you know, traveling all over the country and, and building houses and fixing up places. So yeah, they learned a lot of skills and a lot of independence. They both um, started school in Alaska. We had 160 acres that we homesteaded. So their life, you know, for the first 10 years or so was going out in the woods and playing and, you know, running around in the fields and going fishing. And they had, they had a great childhood. I think they oh, and learned yeah. a lot of independence that way. My yeah. son, when he had his child came to me one day and he said, mom, how tall do you think that tree was outside your office in Alaska? And I said, oh, I don't know. It's probably 40 feet or so. Why? And he said, didn't that bother you when we climbed to the top of it? And I said, <laughs> well, you never fell out. You never got hurt. I, no. <laughs> All of a sudden, when he had his own children, he realized, you know, the, the fragility of that. But they were very competent. And, you know, I figured they, they could do it. So they did. Oh, that's neat. That's neat. So now, um, the ladies all received a package with their um, goodie bag for joining the retreat. And they have the stash and dash. And they have all of the supplies needed, including the fabric to make that. Do you have any advice for them? I do have some tips for that. So I actually dug out a couple of stash and dashes that I could show. Um, these are both ones that we made with fabrics from Free Spirit Fabrics. And I think they kind of show how how different you can make them. This is one that we made with some fabric from Sarah Sapansky, and we did kind of a monochromatic look. But Stash and Dash is awesome because it's got three zippered pockets that you can use for anything under the sun. And then when you fold it up, it has a little, um, strap that goes through a little slider so you can no matter how full you have it you can still get it closed there's a vinyl pocket on the back that is great if you want to put something in that you can see easily we kind of had in mind when we made this an organizer to put into the car so you could put your insurance papers and your you know registration and stuff here so it's easy to find when you get stopped for speeding And then on the inside, maybe you could do a, a, you know, first aid kit or, you know, just things that you might need in the car. Lots of people love using this for English paper piecing, um, you know, for makeup. There's so many ways you can use it. So this one, again, is kind of monochromatic. This one we made using Tula um, Pink's fun um, tiny beast fabric and we mixed it up a little on here we used different colors of zippers for each of the zippers on both of these we used white mesh because we had really light insides but it's fun to even mix and match the colors of mesh Um, and then instead of doing the fabric colored strap as we did on this one we just used Tula's new webbing um, to make the the strap closure on this so that saves you a little bit of time. And if it matches your fabric, it's a fun way to do that. I wanted to talk just a little bit about um, these mesh pockets and putting zippers on them. Um, There's a few tricks. I didn't have time to make step outs of those particular pockets, but that's the same process that we um, do in, or used to do in our ultimate travel bag. And so I thought I would show the steps for that. So basically what you're going to do on these mesh pockets is you're going to bind the top edge of the mesh, you're going to attach it to the bottom of the zipper, and then you're going to bind the top edge of the zipper. On this one, 
actually you're doing exactly that on on every one of them so when you as assemble the bag you'll sew this one in first this one will overlap the bottom of that to cover the raw edges on the bottom of it and then this one will overlap that one to cover its raw edges and then its raw edges will be caught in the bottom of the bag. So your first step is to bind the top edge of the mesh. And one thing that we do when we are binding anything is we don't take our binding and press it. We just take it, fold it in half with the wrong, wrong side together, so right side out, and we bring the long edges of it together and we pin it every two to three inches just to hold it together. In the very first class that I ever taught, I was teaching my Annie's Favorite Purses pattern to my local quilt guild. And I was kind of whining that sometimes when I bound an edge and folded the binding over, I got wrinkles in it. And one of the ladies in the class said, well, how did you prepare your binding? Did you press it? And I said, oh yeah, I folded it in half and pressed it like they say. And she said, well, that's your problem. I said, what do you mean? And she said, if you will not press it, if you'll skip pressing it and just fold it and pin it and sew it on, you'll avoid that problem. And I have never pressed a binding since then. And it really does make a difference. And if you think about it, if you have a sharp crease pressed in here, you know how your layers don't move the same when you're sewing several layers together. If your bottom layer of your binding moves just a little bit different than the top layer, as you sew that on, when you go to fold that over and stitch along the edge, if they if if you've got a sharp crease folded in there, it's not going to line up exactly the same and it's going to cause wrinkles. So when you don't have that in there, you can just kind of take your fingers and massage the edge of that and get rid of those wrinkles and it lays really nice and flat. So that's the first step is to take your binding, fold it in half and pin it. Then I lay my mesh on top or I put my fabric on top. It doesn't really matter which side you do. I prefer to sew with the fabric on top. Some of my staff prefers to sew with the mesh on top. I always say, try it both ways and see which one works best for you. I think it really depends on your machine and how it pulls the fabric through. But again, I usually put the mesh on bottom, the fabric on top. The secret here is to get those edges even and then just sew a nice accurate quarter inch seam all the way along that edge. Then you're going to take that fabric and you're going to press everything up towards the binding. So if you do it from this side, and this is a time where your Biani stiletto and pressing tool comes in handy because it's got a little pressing tool on the end. Again, you don't want to press the edge of that binding. So taking it to the iron makes it a little bit problematic. So using this pressing tool, I just run along that edge and I press my seam up towards the binding. So it's going to look like this. I hope you can see that. So up towards that, and then I take this edge and fold it over. And when I'm done, all my raw edges of mesh and binding are enclosed inside that edge of binding. And I'll usually put a few wonder clips on there to hold it, or even better, once you get that pressed, if you take some of our new basting tape and you pull off a strip to cover that, I'm just gonna do a little strip here, but I can put a strip of basting tape on there So our basting tape is double-sided. It's super sticky. It's only an eighth of an inch wide, so you can keep it out of the seam. Put it on there, press it down to get it good and you know tight on there, and then just peel away the paper. I have found if I tear the um, strip rather than cutting it with scissors, it's much easier to remove the paper, so that's a little tip. But then you can just bring your fabric around and stick it right in place and it's going to hold it in place really well and make it really easy when you go to sew that, to sew all the way down the edge. So when you're done, you're going to end up with lo what looks like this. You've got your edges bound. It should look exactly the same on both sides because when you sew, your stitching should come out in the same place on the other side. Mine doesn't always come out perfectly. Usually it looks the best on the top. So as this comes out of my machine, I just take a little wonder clip and put it with the colored side up on the side that I that was on top. I know that's the right side. So when I go to put it in my project, I don't have to look at it. I just know that's gonna be the best side. 
So you bind the edges of your mesh and then you're going to attach that to a zipper. So we've got, let's just say, here we go. So let's say we're going to attach that to this zipper. So you take your zipper, you position it how you want it with the, um, the slide on the side. This is a zipper that I made from a longer zipper. So I had to add, it must've been probably a 24 inch zipper that I only needed six inches of. So I added a slide on here. So this is going to get cut off. I always wanna make sure I'm using a zipper longer than I need so that I can let that area where the slide is hang off on the end. If you look at this, you can see where the slide is, the zipper tape, bulges out on each side. As soon as I move the zipper slide past that, it goes straight again. So by keeping that off and outside my pocket, I have a nice straight area to sew when I know my pocket's going to be nice and straight when I get it installed. So I'll take my piece that I have um, bound. I'll take my basting tape. Again, I'm just going to, well, I may as well go all the way across here. So this is a lot bigger than what you're going to be doing, but same concept. So I take a piece of basting tape, I put it on there, I run along it really good with my fingers to get it good and tight, pull the paper away. And then what you're going to do is take this and put it on top of your zipper. When you do this, again, you wanna make sure you're avoiding that stop. You want to position this and I'm gonna get it on and then I'm gonna hold it up and show you what I did. You want to position it so that you don't see any zipper tape underneath sticking out under the bottom of the binding. So you can see there, you don't see any zipper tape underneath that bound edge. Then I want to turn it around and make sure that I don't see any binding at the bottom of the zipper. And it looks like I did that really well. So <laughs> I don't always do that when I'm uh, this far away. Usually I have to have my nose right down next to it, but that worked really easy. So get that. You've got that. And the nice thing is now you don't have to have any pins in there, um, you know, distorting it. And you don't, obviously you couldn't use wonder clips because you can't get them on the inside, but you've got that held in place. Ooh. Now you're going to go to your sewing machine and you're going to sew a about the same distance from the upper folded edge as you sewed when you attached it at the bottom. You're gonna sew that all the way across the top. When you get to the end, you'll just pivot and stitch across that low short end. And then you'll go back across that bottom line of stitching and come back up the side. And when you're done, it's gonna look like this. This is one where we did, uh, this is a, a big pocket that goes in it and it has some mesh at the bottom so the zipper's not right up at the top but same difference so you've got two lines of stitching one across the top one across the or one this one first and then across no this one first uh, this one first then across the bottom and your your zipper is in there really nice and secure so basting tape makes a huge difference on that and a stiletto and pressing tool. The other tip to know when you're cutting out your mesh is that mesh has more stretch on the crosswise grain than on the lengthwise grain, just like fabric. So when you buy a half yard package, it's 54 inches wide, 18 inches tall, and, and it's stretchier on the 54 inch wide part. So when we cut out our pockets, we like to have it more stable up and down the stretchy here. So we always cut with the height going this way, the width going this way. And that way um, it's gonna stretch and, and fit in there really nicely. So that's a tip for cutting. We did a tip for attaching the binding and or the bound edge. And then you're just going to take another piece of binding, sew it to the back of your zipper, fold it over to the front. And that's what's going to give you this nice look here. So you, you've got all your edges finished and it just looks beautiful. It sure does. Hey, I just wanted to tell you, um, when we were talking a couple of days ago, I had mentioned how, how excited I was for your basting tape. Um, as a quilt shop owner, you know, we get to try different products and I've, I had a product, I don't stock it anymore, but it was super sticky. 
and it was much thicker. And I did use it on a pillow that I that I made. And it's really hard to work with because now that the project is complete, that tape is still there. So it's hard for me to open up that zipper on that pillow. Ah, yeah. Yeah, we, we so. went through probably, I don't know how many rolls that they sent us of different types of tape and different widths. And we experimented with them, you know, for several months. And this one was, you know, hands down everybody's choice because it's so sticky. It's a lot stickier than any of the ones we tried. You put it on there and it stays on there. Like if I want to take this off, you know, I can get it off, but trying to pull this tape around here, you know, it's, yeah. it's a little, well, there it goes, you know, so it's not okay. impossible to get it off there, but it doesn't come off without you making an effort to get it out of there. And the thing that we found is if you sew through this, it, it, it will gum up your needle if you sew through it a lot. So by making it as narrow as we did, we were able to, you know, position it so that you can stitch on the sides of it. So if you happen to sew through it, I always try to put it where I know I'm not going to sew through it. If you do happen to sew through it a few stitches, it's probably you're not even going to notice it. But if you did, you know, that whole length right through the tape, your your needle's going to get sticky. Just get a little cotton ball and put some alcohol on it and run it along your needle and all that stickiness will go away. Okay. And um, the Schmetz people they have a new super stick or a super non-stick needle too um we had them on our last virtual quilt retreat where they gave a talk so we did stock those too um anyway so that there are a lot of products out there to help our customers achieve the best results amen yeah one other tip this project mm -hmm. uses a little bit of vinyl here on the back and I don't know, I have packed so many things to that got shipped to Houston. Let me look real quick. Yeah, I'm pretty sure my mesh or my little piece of vinyl went off to Houston, so I don't have it here. But we have what's called Biani's Premium Vinyl. It's a 16 gauge vinyl, so it's really heavy and sturdy. I have bags that I made 25 years ago that I still use every day. And, you know, the vinyl is looks as good as it did when I started. I throw my bags in the washer and dryer. Um, if you are washing uh, and drying vinyl, just make sure that you take it out as soon as, you know, the dryer stops and lay it flat so it doesn't get wrinkly because once it cools, those wrinkles will stay in there. But um, our new vinyl has a paper coating on the back. It's kind of almost like... Um, contact paper when you get it. So it's got a white backing paper that you have to peel away. But the beauty of that white backing paper is that it makes the vinyl visible when you go to cut it. So leave the paper on it until you have all your pieces cut out. I usually just pull the vinyl back a little bit and stick my label in there. You don't wanna put pins through vinyl. Um, because the leaf holes that won't heal. So I just stick it in there and the static holds it in place. I use wonder clips on the edges rather than pins. And the secret with vinyl is vinyl has a lot of static. And so if you are sewing on a machine that has a plas any plastic on the bed, I sew on a Bernina 530 and there's a little window right in front of you know my, my feed dogs that is apparently so you can see to open the door on the bobbin case. I just cover it up because that little piece of vinyl, as soon as my anything that has vinyl on it stick, hits it, it stops and it won't move. So I just take painter's tape and put a couple of strips over that little window and then I can sew just like normal. The other thing is if you're sewing on a machine that has a plastic foot, you may have difficulty with the vinyl because again, it doesn't wanna move. So a, met, a Teflon foot is the best or a nonstick foot. I really love, if you're a Bernina person, I love the number 53 foot. It um, is only an eighth of an inch wide. And usually when I'm sewing vinyl into a project, I'm attaching it by sewing an eighth of an inch from the edge so that my bindings will cover it later. So that foot is helpful. But uh, 
that just goes like you're sewing regular. A metal foot usually works pretty well. If you have a plastic foot and you know can't get a different foot, put a piece of tape like masking tape or paint or um, shipping tape even on the bottom, cut a hole so your needle can go through and that will usually solve that staticky problem too. I sew, it, my machine is in a koala cabinet and it has one of those big, you know, clear acrylic tables all the way around mm -hmm. it that the vinyl doesn't want to go against either. I've tried the the glide strips. They didn't seem to make any difference. So I found some tape that I bought on Amazon that's called a non-static tape. And I just put strips of that because I didn't want to have my table covered with blue masking tape, painter's tape. I wanted it to be, you know, not so visible. This is a clear tape and I just put it across and that has solved that problem too. And I still have visibility yeah. through the table. Yeah, because some tables that I have sold, um, you have the option, do you want an acrylic table or do you want um, wood to match the table? Yeah. I always thought, well, who would want the wood? <laughs> That's a reason why you might want the wood. I, I don't know that I had that option, so I yeah. went for the acrylic. But if, right. you know, I and I just had to do it kind of from right in front of the foot and to the left. I didn't worry about anything on the right because my piece right. is never going to be really in trouble over there. And then, right. you know, you can even sew through the paper. Mm -hmm. If if you don't have tape handy, you can just take the paper that you pulled away when you went to sew and put it under there. The problem is it slides around and, you know, having something that's attached <coughs> makes it easier. But you can sew through the paper and then just pull it away. That's another option too. Sure, that sounds like a good option. All right. Well, um, how about some of the other projects? What what would you say is your best selling pattern, or maybe the top three? I can tell you our best selling pattern right off the top of my head, and I may have to go grab one to show it to you. But clam up, actually, oh, it, we have we have one. Do you have clam up there? Have it. Yeah, yeah we have will. clam up. I mean, by far is our best sign pattern. And I think people like oh, it because it's and quick and easy the... to make. The pattern includes five sizes. They're fabulous for gifts. You know, you can nest them inside each other and store them. They're great for using up leftover pieces of quilted fabric. The pattern includes instructions for making it quilted or non-quilted. So there's just a whole bunch of versatility in there. People absolutely love that pattern. Other really popular patterns, and this is probably, if anyone asks me what is my favorite pattern, um, probably my catch-all caddy. I have made one of these for every work table um, at home, at the office. I have one on my desk. I have one in my bathroom. I give them for shower gifts. Both of my kids used them on the changing tables to put diapers in. They are just super handy. And as you can see, this is, um, it's got pockets all the way around the outside. And then on the inside, instead of pockets, it has bellowed dividers. So these are made so that they fall flat against, I don't know if you can see that, they'll fall flat against the side of the bag if they're not in use. But when you put stuff in them, they expand and they expand all the way from the top to the bottom. So if you have lots of little things like this, I have my turning tools, my glue sticks, my pipe cleaners that I use to clean my machine, you know, my nail file, all those things. And you worry about them falling out, just put them in a cup and then set that in there and it goes all the way to the bottom. I can take my big bottle of water and put that in. And because it's not closed at the bottom, it sits in there nice and secure. You know, it doesn't fall over. I keep thinking I need to make one of these for in my car because I have spilled water in my lunchbox so many times and that because I bring like six bottles of water to work with me every day and these don't have they just have open lids and yeah I need to make one of these for that but they hold a ton of stuff I because I again I have them on every table I make sure I pack them in exactly the same way so my seam rippers are here my markers are here my hemostats and snippers are here my scissors are in the back my circle rulers are here so that every one of them is packed exactly the same way. So I know right where to go for whatever I'm looking for. And I know right what's missing if something's you know not full. We have a smaller version of this called In Control. 
that's about 60%, I think. And I like that right next to my sewing machine. It's got a smaller footprint. And basically it holds almost everything that this does, maybe just not quite as many of them, but anything that I need next to my machine goes in there. And it's great on the coffee table to hold remote controls, um, you know, reading glasses, all those things. People like making either one of these for kids who play, you know, the Nintendo and stuff. They can put all this stuff in there and easily carry it wherever they go and not, you know, have cords strung all the way around. So many ways you can use that. So that's another really, definitely my favorite. Another one that I really love is called Running with Scissors. And this is a pattern that I designed at the request of Tula Pink. Uh, she wanted something that she could put all of her tools and hardware in. And so we designed it to be really compact, but mm -hmm. to have lots of versatility. So it's got tall pockets on this side that are perfect for scissors and rotary cutters and things like that. These scissors might be a little bit tall to fit in here, but like these scissors will fit mm -hmm. good. Um, we purposely designed it for tool as tools since she was the one who asked for it so the pattern the way the divisions are made really hold her tools beautifully i always tell people if you're making this and not putting tool as tools in there lay out what you want to put in it before you sew all these divisions because you might need to make some modifications for instance one of these pockets i think it's this one over here i put my karen k buckley scissors in which i don't happen to have here but maybe it's this one. If I sewed all the way up on this division, they would sit so far up that they'd, they'd you know, impact um, access to this pocket. By taking this division and only sewing it to here, I'm able to put them further down in the pocket so they go all the way to the bottom. So there, there's a, a vinyl pocket and a quilted pocket, and you can put stuff in both of them. There's above that a vinyl pocket that I use to hold my turning tools. And then on the other side, we have two mesh pockets that are perfect for putting needles and rotary cutter blades, glue sticks, basting tape, all those little things in, and then more pockets for your smaller tools. In the middle, we put elastic, fold over elastic strips. Tula likes to put her sewing machine feet in here. I use this like for my glue stick or my chalk markers, spools of thread, all those things fit in there. And then on the outside, you've got zippered pockets on both sides. So in the back, I put my circle rulers, which come in five sizes. I put extra stilettos. This is what I carry when I teach class. In the front, I put my little triangle rulers that I use when I um, join the ends of the binding. And I put my little small um, cutting mat in there. So it holds a ton of stuff. Again, we designed it for Tula's tools, which are fabulous. They have a really beautiful finish. We didn't want them banging against each other when you closed the case. So we made a little protector to put in between. You can use this as an ironing mat. I like to use it as a pin cushion. A lot of times I'll just stick my pins in there, but I put that in between when I close it and then zip it up, just pinch the edge and you can zip it and everything is contained in a nice compact little case. When we designed this and got it all going, I mean, we we actually designed about four patterns in the process of this because we couldn't decide what we wanted to do. We Catch All Caddy already existed, but we wanted a smaller version. So in control tried, it was too risky that you were gonna have scissors get their points damaged. So that became a pattern, but not the one for Tula. We did another one that became Divide and Conquer. We did another one that I don't even remember what it became. But we this we finally decided we wanted to do. But we found that when we got her heavy tools in here, it was hard to keep it standing up. And we felt like you don't want to have you don't have room on your table to leave this lane flat. It's going to be easier to access it if it will stand up. And so we worked for two weeks trying all kinds of different ways to stabilize this and make it stand up. And because those tools were so heavy, we just couldn't figure it out. Finally, someone said, well, what it needs under it is an A-frame. What pattern do we have that's shaped like an A-frame? And so we went and got our um, open wide pattern 
and saw that that would work. It wasn't quite the right size, but then we, so we designed this pattern, which is called take a stand so that this could be the stand. You can see it's got an A-frame shape. And so when we get to class or when we're at home, we just drape running with scissors over it and it keeps it standing up and easy to work with. Originally, we planned to put both of those together in one pattern, but the pattern was like 30 pages long, wouldn't fit in the bags. And so we said, all right, let's make that a separate pattern. And so many people had said, well, does this fit inside that when it's done? No, it doesn't. We sized it specifically so that you couldn't see it underneath there. And so that the running with sisters rested on the table rather than being up above because we didn't want it to collapse this. So we then added a second size to the pattern for take a stand. So it includes two sizes. And this, when filled, will fit in the large size. So you can, you know, carry that all as one. You can also put, put a small sewing machine in here. A little Janome Jim, a little um, Bernina Burnett fits in here. A Foff Passport fits in here. The only thing I would do different if you were going to use a featherweight fits nicely in here. If you're going to use it as a sewing machine bag, you want it to be more sturdy and stable. So there you can put a base stabilizer in it. And we do have an acrylic one um, that fits in there. You can also, the pattern is designed to have just a carrying strap that connects from one side to the other, which is fine if you're just you know carrying a few things in here. But if you're carrying something as precious as a sewing machine, I would recommend making two, two sets of these tabs so that you can put one here and one here, and then you can make your handle, one handle that goes on this side, one handle that goes on that side, and that makes it just more stable to carry. So again, that is take a stand and two sizes of that, and then this is running with scissors. Very good. Boy, you have really thought of so many aspects when you're designing that. You know, when we work on designing a pattern, it it takes months and we go through so many iterations and so many things, so many design changes before we even start writing the pattern. Once we get that figured out and start writing the pattern, then we, we make several um, versions of it. We have an, a model maker who makes it. We have another um, person who works for us from home who makes it. And then once we feel like it's ready to go, we send it to outside testers who test it. So it's not unusual for a pattern to have 50 versions before we finalize it and say, okay, we're done. But it yeah. really helps because very seldom do people, you know, have problems making it. Every once in a while, somebody will find a typo that every single one of us missed, but doesn't happen too often anymore. So that's really been nice. Yeah. And, and you have videos tied to your patterns also? For at least the past six years, eight years, we've, for every new pattern that's come out, we've filmed a video to go with it, which is another huge process. The patterns that we're releasing at market next week have pretty much been done since June. And we're still, we had to film videos for a couple of them. We had filmed some of them, but we're still working on getting those videos edited. So um, we probably won't start shipping those patterns until early November so that the videos will be ready. But, you know, I write a script, we film the videos, we film a lot of B-roll so that you can see, you know, all the ways you can use it. It's, it's very much a, it's a much bigger job than it was when I started. Let's put it that way. Once you get a whole bunch of people involved, things kind of grow, which is good. Right, right, right. So I've had some questions. Are are your new patterns that you'll be releasing, are they available for my customers or do will they be available in November? So we added them to our website yesterday uh, for pre-order. And we said we'll probably start shipping November 1st. We have shipped patterns to Checker, so you can order them and get them from Checker okay. and have them ready. You'll probably have them about the time we have them. We just, we don't want patterns going out until the videos are available because people always want the video right away. And yes. so that's kind of what we're holding on. But Jake, have we started shipping to Checker? Uh, so. I'm pretty sure we've shipped to Checker. Our goal is always that stores are stocked and have them 
when we release them so that you can buy them at your local quilt shop. We really, really work hard to support local quilt shops. We appreciate everything that you do. You are kind of our boots on the ground. You know, if, mm -hmm. if we can't reach all the people and you're there every day, helping people answering questions. And so um, we really work hard to support you. Mm -hmm. So are those videos only available after purchase or are there videos that people can see at any time? Are they exclusive? They are exclusive to the pattern. So we, well, we, we filmed several videos. So we film what we called a marketing video, which is an introduction and then a closer look. And those are right on the product page of the pattern at our website. So, and you're welcome once we have those up and ready to go, you're welcome to, you know, take the link and put it on your newsletter and send it out to your customers so you can share that with them. Those are public and available to everybody. The add-on videos that explain how to do the more unique or challenging parts of the pattern are available to people who buy the pattern. So we include in every pattern a coupon that has a unique code on it. So you wanna get the paper pattern in hand and then take out that coupon and then go to our website, purchase that add-on video, use the coupon so you get it free and then it goes in your digital library. So you watch it at our website. If you don't want to buy the pattern for some reason, but you want to watch the video, you can also buy the video for $5, but it's not gonna do you a whole lot of good without having the pattern. So basically you get the, the video free as part of the pattern purchase. Okay, okay, that makes sense. And hopefully that clarifies, yeah. Um, that's cool. That's very cool. Um, what is the new stuff? Yeah. How many pattern. new patterns do you have? So we, um, did five new patterns this time. And unfortunately I don't have one sitting here, but we did one called courtside. That is a, actually, I wonder if I have some sitting Pickle close ball, by. Jake's going to run. Look, Jake, if you can look on that. Oh, good. Jake's bringing me one. So we've had lots of requests for a um, backpack or a bag to carry pickleball rackets in. Okay. And we didn't want something that was just for pickleball players. We wanted something a little more versatile. So we designed this um, larger backpack. It's the biggest of our backpack patterns now, but you can put up to four pickleball rackets in here or two tennis rackets. If you're doing tennis rackets, you have to zip open the pocket to be able to get them inside there. But um, that can hold that, or you know, if you wanna just keep it zipped and put whatever you want in there if you're not using it for rackets. It's got a, the pattern includes instructions for a fabric pocket here. I want it to make one with mesh just to see how it would work. And so this one has a mesh pocket on the side. And then on the back, there's another big deep pocket as well as a trolley sleeve. So you can hook it over your handles on your rolling luggage. And when you open it up, so it's got a zipper that goes all the way down on one side and just partway on that side that has the pockets. Got all kinds of stuff stuffed in here. So, you know, you can see, you can easily access the inside. And then I'm gonna turn this inside out so you can see what the inside looks like. So on the inside, we did a full height zippered pocket on one side. So, you know, that goes all the way to the bottom. My laptop fits perfectly in here. So this is the bag I'm going to be carrying back and forth to work every day um, once we're done with all of our videoing. And then we did little mesh pockets on here for little things. And then on the other side, we did bellowed dividers, just like you have in Catch-All Caddy. So again, these will fall flat against the side of the bag when it's closed but if you want to put your bottle of water in there you know you can set that in there and it's not going to fall over so that is courtside you can carry it with the handles or you can carry it as a backpack and then we did um, an update of our ditty bags pattern we did an update of our out to lunch pattern and added an extra size in that we did a new wallet pattern called payday that has two sizes and we did a really simple a little pattern that's going to be part of our $5 series that's called So Simple Wallet. 
and it's one piece of fabric, one piece of interfacing, and you can fold it and stitch it just a few seams, and you can make either a one, a two, or a three pocket version. So, you know, you can make one for any purse. If you're giving somebody a gift card, it's really a simple way to present a, a gift card, you know, with something that they can use beyond that. So that's what's coming soon. Wow, you are a busy person. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, yeah, so we do have a trunk show that we will be showing. Nice. The, the hour is really going by fast. So we do have a trunk show here. Is there one that would be a... Oh, is there one that would work as a briefcase? Um, uh, we do have a, we have a pattern called laptop computer carriers that, um, is perfect. That's what I carry right now with my laptop back and forth. It holds like a standard 14 inch laptop. We have another pattern that's essentially the same called executive carryalls. That's for like a widescreen 17 inch laptop. And then we have a smaller version called netbook computer carriers. That's for smaller, like iPads and stuff. All three of those patterns have two versions in each one. So one is just a basic bag with padded handles, a zippered pocket on the front. The other one has more bells and whistles. So it has a padded carrying strap. It has an extra zippered pocket on the inside that's quilted. It's got, I think a mesh pot. It's got more, more features, but both of those are in each. And the, the, the simpler one is sized just a little bit smaller. So if you want extra padding for your laptop, it fits in the other bag, but any of those would make a great briefcase for, for somebody to take to and from work. And depending on the fabric you choose, you know, it's perfect for a guy or a teen or I've seen yeah. people take the little one, the netbook computer carriers and make it for their grandsons um, and so cute. And they absolutely love them. You know, they feel like dad going off with their, their bag to work. Yeah. Um, I do have a question here. If you have directional fabric, which is the left side? Which is the left side? Yeah. So if you have directional fabric like this, mm -hmm. so in our patterns, you have to read all the patterns we've done for probably at least the last eight or 10 years are written with the first dimension being the height, the second dimension being the width. So think about when you go into the store and you buy fabric, it's wrapped mm -hmm. on a bolt, it's 42 to 44 inches wide, and you say, I want a half yard. So the half yard is your height and the other is your width. So that's kind of how we do our measurements. So it's 18 by 44 inches. So when you cut, for instance, this pocket is gonna tell you to cut it 10 by 16, let's say. I don't remember what these measurements are, but 10 is gonna be the height, 16 is gonna be the width, and you're going to want to um, you know, position your ruler on there so that your top of your design is at the top of that piece. When I'm cutting something directional like this, I always make sure that like say this is 16 inches wide, my eight inch line is right down the middle of what I want so that I know that I'm centering whatever it is I'm cutting out of that. Okay. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, and, it, and if it doesn't, we will open up for a few questions. Um, but before, before we do that, um, I also wanted to mention that I had asked you for a list of all the patterns, which I did receive. Thank you very much. You're it welcome. Is a long list. I, we I, have written over 250 patterns since I okay. started 25 years ago. So that's an average of 10 a year. Yeah. So it's a so lot. Are all of those patterns on that list available? We discontinued about 60 patterns a okay. few years ago. When I started, I was um, doing shows a lot with Superior Threads and Heather Purcell, who's Mother Superior, and I designed a lot of quilt patterns together. She would come up with the idea. We'd sit down at my computer and design it in EQ. I'd write the pattern. She'd make the quilt pay someone amazing to quilt it, but she owned all the quilts. So I didn't have samples of hardly any of them, a couple, a few of them I had made, but quilts just weren't what we were 
we yeah. moved on to purses and bags more. So we discontinued a lot of those, plus just some older patterns that, you know, weren't our best sellers. And, uh, mm -hmm. but we still have, I would say at, at least 150. Uh, yeah, it was a long list, but everything yeah. that you sent me, is that available? I guess I should yes. ask. Yes. Yeah. Okay. If okay. it's on that list, yep. it is available. And I have not shared that list yet with everybody. So I will be doing that later. Yeah, and any of any of your customers too, they can always go to our website and, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, a, a thing that says patterns and we have them mm -hmm. organized in categories so they can, uh -huh. you know, if they're looking for a purse pattern, they can click on the purses and bags category and see what's there. But whatever they find on there, they just need to let you know, and you can order it from Checker doesn't probably carry every single one of those patterns or brewer. It, we sell to all the yeah. major distributors, but yeah. we have them in stock. So if, if you yeah. can't get them there, you can come to us and we can ship them to you. Sure. We'll, we'll definitely work together to gather up whatever our customers want and need, even when it comes to supplies. Um, I will also add that we have the clam up bag. And for those of you that can't see me, let me add a spotlight so you can see us again. These are the clam up bags and Jess has made these already. Mm -hmm. These ones are Annie's that she sent us for the trunk show made out of Tula pink. This one is the big one. This it, it's kind of like those Russian dolls it's that, are nesting exactly. dolls that keep nesting, that keep keeps <laughs> giving and giving and giving. And another so one, I'll do it. Up. I always say when people make those for gifts, they should put them all in together. And then, you know, the granddaughter opens it and it's, oh, grandma made me a bag. And then she zips it open. Oh, grandma made me two bags. Oh, yeah, grandma the, made me three bags. <laughs> this <laughs> oh. is the tiniest <laughs> one. Yeah. She, well, so, she's done some. Yeah. The plastic. Did I miss is that, that, iron, that uh, is that the iron on vinyl? that's slicker that's iron on vinyl from lazy girl designs and we do have that on our website but you can get that straight from them as well and that okay. um you can turn any smooth fabric into a laminate just by ironing it on so the secret mm -hmm. on that is you you don't want to wash it you want to just wipe it out and you don't want to quilt through it so you know consider where you want to use it. So we usually put right. it in a couple of them just so people see that as an option. Sure. And we do have some of that yeah. in this in right. the store also. Um I know you have limited time and and now we are on for an hour. So we better open it up to anybody who might have questions. Unmute yourself and are you okay with the like maybe sure. 10 minutes or so? Sure. Okay. I have to I have to pick up my grandson at school today and so I have to be out of here pretty soon but I've got 5 or 10 minutes. Okay. So go ahead and unmute if your question is still outstanding and ask away. Can I ask a question? Can any zipper be used? What is Was the that question? The Are there any zipper videos? No, just can you use any zipper? Like any packaged zipper? So our patterns are written for using handbag zippers. And I, if you noticed when I held that zipper up, a handbag zipper is a number four and a half zipper. And a dress zipper is a number three. The, the, the number means the measurement in millimeters across the teeth. So a handbag zipper is a lot wider than a regular dress zipper. And as you can see, you have some of the tapes showing when you put it in. They have extra big slides on them or pulls on them, which are easy to grab. And they're just so much easier. And a lot of our patterns come up in particular. The measurements are based on you using a zipper that's that size. So we definitely recommend using the Biani zippers um, for these projects. We have them in 24 inch single slide, 30 inch double slide. Both of those are available in 48 colors. We have um, 40 inch double slide and what we call zippers by the yard where you get four yards of zipper tape and 16 color coordinated poles. Those are available in 32 colors, I believe. So lots of colors to, to match your project. But we definitely recommend using a handbag zipper for our projects because they're just going to be stronger, sturdier, longer lasting and much easier to install. 
And they're all made by YKK. So they're the the best in the business. And you know, you know, you don't want to make a bag and have the zipper fail on you because you're going to have to make the whole bag again. You know, it's, it's, Mm -hmm. you can't fix it. And so they're so worth using the right thing. And that's why, that's why we love your zippers, Annie, for handbags. This is like for smaller purses, you know, or a dress. And you can see, hopefully you can see the difference in the width. Yeah. Yeah. This sure. one and the, is definitely wider. And then it's the, about a half an inch more, I believe. The yeah. the dress zipper or the handbag zipper is about an inch and a quarter wide. Yeah. So the, the it, zipper holes are clearly sure. much bigger. So much easier to grab. If you want to put a fabric pull in them, they got a great big hole. So it's easy to do that. Um, well worth using. Thank you. And we do have some fabulous videos on our website. If you um if you go to your digital library, they're in the public videos section, or if you go to our tutorials tab, we have a whole series called Zippers Are Easy, where I show you how to put zipper slides on to both the zippers by the yard. And and you know if you have leftover tape that's cut, how to put them on, and lots of great tips about installing zippers in mesh and vinyl, all kinds of good info. Thank you. I have a question when it talks about the reason I asked about the left-hand side is be- with directional fabric is because in the directions it says to mark from the left-hand side four and a half inches and I think nine and a half inches. But I have directional fabric on the inside. So is the top the left-hand side or the bottom? The top is the top. So put the t- put your put it with your direction at the top. You know, so it's going the way you want, and then the left will just be the the regular left side. Okay, that's not how it is in the instructions, but I'll figure it out. There's a note. Oh, is the pattern written like this? Does it show it like this? Yes, yes. Uh Uh-huh. Okay, so then the left-hand side would be, you know, from from this side, I'm sure. I don't actually, I don't know that it, I'm going to have to look at that pattern. It's been a long time since I wrote that. Per your figure, the top is on the left-hand side. I just answered her question in the chat. Okay. So she... the top's on the left? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, yeah. Linda. I can tell you that my older patterns, when I first started writing patterns, I was a quilter and I had lots of scraps that I wanted to use. And I was much, and I didn't really, at that time, there weren't a lot of directional fabrics. There weren't all these amazing fabrics that we have today. Lots were calicos and stuff. And I used solids a lot and I didn't pay attention to, I was, I did my cutting layouts to make the best use of the fabric basically. And that's probably how this one was designed. So it probably has you cut these pieces out like this. If you're using a directional fabric like this, actually this one you'd probably be fine on because Tula, a lot of times, instead of putting her direction like this, she makes them go sideways because she designs for quilters who want to do fussy cutting and she wants to get as many repeats across that way as she can. Most directional fabrics go this way. So you have to pay careful attention and look at the pattern, you know, and kind of read it and study it a little bit before you start. Our newer patterns, we assume that the fabric is going to be printed with the direction going parallel to the selvages. And so if I wrote stash and dash today, I would have you cut this piece going this direction on the fabric rather than this direction. So as I said, for the past eight years, I've been working with a professional graphic artist who does all my illustrations. The patterns that have add-on videos, if you're new to Biani, that's where I recommend you start. We have a series called the Biani Basics, which are four free patterns with full step-by-step videos from the beginning to the end. I always say, if you haven't made our patterns before, start there because you'll learn all the basic techniques that you need um, to know to make just about any pattern. The older patterns, you're gonna have more success and be happier with them if you've made a few of the newer ones first Mm -hmm. Because I wasn't an illustrator. I, you know, I didn't know those things. I drew what I could draw, you know, in flat. But once it went past that part, there weren't illustrations in there. You know, it was before cameras were doing pictures that you could put in. This was the olden days. And so, you know, there's still great patterns. And if you've made a few of ours, they're going to make perfect sense to you. But um, 
stick with the newer ones with the add-on videos for um, for best success if you're new to us. Okay, and we have a question from Karen Dowd. I am in need of a briefcase, and I'm looking at the bag that's to your left. Would that work for a briefcase without a laptop in it? Uh, I, I probably would do like I said earlier, where you put the double handles on it, but yeah, it probably would. You can see it's got a zippered, big zippered pocket on the front and back. And then when you open it up, let me take this space stabilizer out of here. It's got, it's just a big open bag, but it's got mesh pockets on each side that you could organize stuff in. So, you know, it's got a lot of room to hold whatever you want to carry in there. What is the name of that pattern? This is Take a Stand. Okay. So check out Take a Stand. Also check out um, laptop computer carriers and check out maybe a place for everything and Divide and Conquer. Divide and Conquer is a zippered bag that has a zipper going all the way around it. And it's got vinyl kind of divisions on each side. Jake, is there one sitting over there, Divide and Conquer? I watch. A divide and conquer. Look on that bottom shelf. I think there's an Anna Maria one over there. Karen, you can try laptop. executive carry all too. No. How about handing me that a place for everything then? I think it's called executive carry all 2.0. Or yeah, 2. look at that one. That and that oh, one's super yes. easy to make. So this is a place for everything, and it's designed to carry whatever you want. But it's got zippers that go all the way down so that you can open it flat. And then it's got pocket pages that you can put things in. These are easy to take out, you know, if you don't need them in there. And then it's got pockets on each side. So that might be an option for a briefcase that you could, you know, open it part way on each side and, and put your things in. But if you want it to easily access everything on the inside, you could do that. Divide and Conquer is very similar to this, but it's got, oh, he found it. So this is divide and conquer. You can see it kind of looks the same, but there's an extra um, panel here so that when you open this, it's got vinyl pockets on each side. So vinyl compartments. I love this when I travel. And then it's got pages here that are attached that you can put things in, but that might work depending on what you want you know, to put in it and want to carry. That's another option. This is probably the most complicated of all those. A place for everything would be kind of close to this, but not as complicated. The executive carry would is easy, much easier than these, I think. All right, thank you. You're welcome. There's, there's a question from Nancy. Hi, so on our um, retreat that we're doing this weekend with Pam Shaw, um, our project is the Stash and Dash, uh -huh. and we've got the the pattern through Pam's shop. So she bought them for us and we we got them in our, our kits. Uh -huh. Is there a way that we can get the video for that? I don't have a code in my pattern. There is actually not a video available for that. And your okay. pattern may say that there was a blog post. When we first released that pattern, we did a summer sew along with it and we did a blog. But when we updated our website several years ago, we lost all of that content completely so that doesn't exist anymore okay. either all right so, yeah you. you'll have to ask pam for help or watch some of our regular videos we'll you, have jess yeah video. jess has made these before <laughs> so <laughs> jess is we'll here. ask her <laughs> yeah i'm like annie i don't have time to sew anymore i'm running a business <laughs> It's amazing how how much time I'm I'm leaving for Norway just a few days after I get back from market and festival and I'm teaching four classes there that I've not taught before so I have to make step outs and I thought oh you know a, a day each I'll have them done. I've been working for two days on the first one and I'm still not done and I only have four days left so I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> no sleep. I'm going to go home this afternoon and figure out something for my grandson to do so I can sew for a while. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? I'm looking for hand raises. I don't see any. Well, Ann, Annie, I know how busy you are. We thank you very much for joining 
our retreat. We're excited to get to work on this. And um, good luck with Houston. I wish I could be there, but unfortunately, this is a busy time of year for quilt shops. So I'm one of those. I'm happy I have Bernina University to go to. So yeah. thank you again very much. And for everybody else, you can can stay on and we will take some questions and kind of finish our- Thank you, Annie. Thank you so much for inviting me. I enjoyed visiting with all of you and, and make sure when you get those stash and dash bags done, you submit them to our monthly photo contest. We give away three or four, three to five prizes, $50 gift certificates for some of them. So it's well worth your time to submit those. And if you're looking for inspiration, you can always click on the photo contest tab and all the submissions that people have sent in over the years are in there. And you can filter them by name of fabric, you know, pattern names, so you can get lots of ideas for things that you want to make. So send them in and we'd love to see them. Thank you again. And we will see you again soon, I hope. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks for featuring us also on Facebook. Yeah. All right. So I haven't been able to keep up with messages as well as... Um, talking to Annie, but um, you might want to stop recording, Pam. Yep, that's what I'm doing. Oops. <laughs>